The following images were originally posted by one of our Facebook followers, who owns Flare. Coincidentally, these images posted on our Facebook page have gone viral across the social media sites in the last few days. A Skywatch observer from Iowa captured these still images on November 16th, showing a planetoid or brown dwarf visible to the upper left of the sun prior to sunset. This may be the same object that is now said to be following the path of Venus across the western sky. And this image possibly showing the same object as it can on November 9th from southwest Alberta, Canada, showing this object shortly after Venus had set below the horizon. This amateur astronomer has indicated that this object is observable just to the left and slightly above Venus in the night sky. And finally, this image from Argentina on November 12th, showing the brown dwarf at the four arrows visible prior to sunset. Cierto entrate in Spanish refers to the entrance of the body, a celestial body in this research. is back in the news again today. The California Institute of Technology published a study claiming they have discovered a true ninth planet beyond Pluto. For the first time in 170 years, evidence of this ninth planet was found on the far edge of the system. Astronomers at, this, at the California Institute of Technology have not directly seen it yet, but they think it's up to 10 times bigger than Earth and 20 times farther away than Neptune. Two scientists at Caltech say they've discovered a ninth planet in the outer corners of our solar system. It's pretty exciting to know it's out there and waiting to be found. Two years ago, we realized that there was something funny going on in the outer solar system. What these orbits are, are showing us, they're showing us sort of a gravitational one-way sign towards the existence of an additional body. These researchers say for the last 13 years, a handful of objects have been found by other astronomers, and all of these objects swing in the same direction. That can't happen by chance, so we knew something funny was going on. Many may remember Mike Brown for his role in demoting Pluto as a planet about a decade ago. What's the evidence that it's there? So the evidence is that we can look at objects orbiting around our solar system and figure out why their motions are the way they are because of the gravitational influences of everything else around. So we looked at a small group of objects newly discovered and realized we couldn't actually completely understand their motion. However, if we insert into the equation about that an object about the size of this planet nine, everything then worked out perfectly. So that's what gives the suspicion that it really does exist. They can't exactly see this thing from a telescope or, or anything like that. Instead, they are using data about uh, how other objects as far out as Pluto uh, are, are reacting and moving out of alignment, getting out of its way. So data like that actually suggests a heavy gravitational pull, which primarily comes from things that are, are qualified to be called planet. Uh, but they do have two giant telescopes on two different continents searching for the physical evidence of this thing's existence. Right now, the best that they can say is that something really, really, really big beyond Pluto exists because space rocks are moving out of the way. Um, as well as it's causing misaligned positions uh, among the outer planets. The orbit of other celestial bodies seem to re be responding to something. What that is, nobody can actually confirm just yet. It's, it's so far away that even though it's big, it's very, very dim and it'd be very tough to spot with a telescope. I'm also fascinated at the idea that this planet could be so far out there and still our sun be the mass that is keeping it in the gravitational pull of our solar system. Right, right, yeah, but no, that's, it's true. That's incredible. And so there was a thought at one point from scientists that when they thought that there was something beyond Pluto, that it might have been all the mass of objects floating in the, in the Kyber belt, but it's not. Right, so, so the, all those objects are out there, and they have a lot of mass, and originally the scientists said, look, a planet is such a crazy idea, maybe it's the Kuiper Belt itself that's pulling it on, on itself and making these, these orbits look funny. And they ran simulations, and they tried to make that work, and it didn't work. It just didn't work. There's not enough stuff out there. So you don't see it, but you said it's all about the numbers. So two scientists are playing around with numbers, and they think what? 
they think, huh, this doesn't add up. Yeah. We need to ask some other folks to take a look at this for us and tell us if we're crazy. And sure enough, that's what they did. The Caltech astronomers looked at the number and said, you know that idea about there being another planet? That's not a crazy idea. It looks like it's really possible. So now what they'll do is they'll let this information out to the rest of the astronomical community to try to help figure out what's going on, to make sure that everything's correct. And now they'll also do the observations. And, and so they've already stepped forward to say they're convinced. Well, it is. It, it, uh, yes, they are pretty well convinced now they need the visual evidence to back it up because, yeah, as I said, the numbers yeah. don't lie. But the critics of this study say that it's possible that this, uh, this large body is simply an ancient core, a core of a, a gas giant that was ejected out to the farthest reaches of the solar system thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. What does this tell us about our solar system? Well, one thing it tells us is that we don't really understand it as well as we thought we did. <laughs> And another is that it probably had a very violent beginning. This thing was probably formed much closer in and then flung out, maybe in a close encounter with Jupiter or something. You mentioned that scientists haven't seen it yet because of how far away it is and yeah. how dim it is. Is there a way for them to get visual evidence? Yes, so, so the biggest telescopes in the world can theoretically see this thing if they're looking in exactly the right place. And with the publication of this new paper today, uh, they are now going to start to look in earnest. Hi, I'm Jim Green, Director of Planetary Science at NASA. You know, NASA works with the international science community to explore our solar system and beyond. We look to unravel the mysteries that intrigue us all as we explore and answer the big questions. Questions like, how did the Earth originate and change over time? How did the solar system begin and evolve? And what will be its destiny? What will be our destiny? Last July 14th, NASA's New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto, capping a half century of exploration of our solar system. It piqued our interest about what lies beyond Pluto and what can we learn about ourselves and the origins of our solar system. The idea of a new planet is certainly an exciting one for me as a planetary scientist, and I think for all of us. The January 20th paper in the astronomical journal is fueling our interest in planetary exploration and stimulating a healthy debate that's part of the scientific process. I couldn't be more pleased about what's happening. You know, it's all about starting the process that could lead to an exciting result. It is not, however, the detection of a new planet. It's too early to say with certainty that there's a so-called Planet X out there. What we're really seeing is an early prediction based on modeling from limited observations. What's exciting is that, like NASA's journey to Mars or New Horizons flyby of Pluto, you will have a front row seat to see how the scientific process unfolds. Theories like this serve to stimulate ideas and conversation. They tap into our innate curiosity. It's important for us to continue to work, and we will. Anytime we have an interesting idea like this, we always apply Carl Sagan's rules for critical thinking, which include independent confirmation of the facts, looking for alternate explanations, and encouraging scientific debate. If Planet X is out there, we'll find it together. Or we'll determine an alternate explanation for the data that we've received so far. Now, let's go explore. But Batygin and Brown are not the first to claim that they've discovered a new major planet beyond Neptune. In fact, the hunt for Planet X has been on for over a century. But every promising claim has ultimately been shut down by scientists. We began in 2009 with the launch of NASA's Kepler mission. Kepler's main scientific objective was to find planets outside of our solar system. It did this by staring at a single field in the sky, this one with all the tiny boxes. And in this one field, it monitored the brightness of over 150,000 stars continuously for four years, taking a data point every 30 minutes. It was looking for what astronomers call a transit. This is when the planet's orbit is aligned in our line of sight, just so that the planet crosses in front of a star. 
And when this happens, it blocks out a tiny bit of starlight, which you can see as a dip in this curve. And so the team at NASA had developed very sophisticated computers to search for transits in all the Kepler data. At the same time of the first data release, astronomers at Yale were wondering an interesting thing: what if computers miss something? And so we launched the citizen science project called Planet Hunters to have people look at the same data. The human brain has an amazing ability for pattern recognition, sometimes even better than a computer. However, there was a lot of skepticism around this. My colleague Deborah Fisher, and today, with the help of over 300,000 science enthusiasts, we have found dozens, and we've also found one of the most mysterious stars in our galaxy. So, to understand this, let me show you what a normal transit in Kepler data looks like. On this graph, on the left-hand side, you have the amount of light, and on the bottom is time. The white line is the light just from the star, what astronomers call a light curve. Now, when a planet transits a star, it blocks out a bit, little bit of this light, and the depth of this transit reflects the size of the object itself. <clears throat> and so, for example, let's take Jupiter. Planets don't get much bigger than Jupiter. Jupiter will make a 1% drop in a star's brightness. Earth, on the other hand, is 11 times smaller than Jupiter, and signal is barely visible in the data. So back to our mystery. A few years ago, planet hunters were sifting through data looking for transits, and they spotted a mysterious signal coming from the star KIC 8462852. The observations in May of 2009 were the first they spotted, and they started talking about this in the discussion forums. They said an object like Jupiter would make a drop like this in the star's light, but they were also saying it was giant. You see, transits normally only last for a few hours, and this one lasted for almost a week. They were also saying that it looks asymmetric, meaning that instead of the clean U-shaped dip that we saw with Jupiter, it had the strange slope that you can see on the left side. This seemed to indicate. That whatever was getting in the way and blocking the starlight was not circular like a planet. There are a few more dips that happened, but for a couple of years it was pretty quiet. And then in March of 2011, we see this: the star's light drops by a whole 15 percent, and this is huge compared to a planet, which would only make a 1 percent drop. We describe this feature as both smooth and clean. It also is asymmetric, having a gradual dimming that lasts almost a week, and then it snaps right back up to normal in just a matter of days. And again, after this, not much happens, until February of 2013. Things just start to get really crazy. There is a huge complex of dips in the light curve that appear, and they last for like a hundred days, all the way up into the Kepler mission's end. These dips have variable shapes. Some are very sharp and some are broad, and they also have variable durations. Some last just for a day or two, and some for more than a week. And there's also up and down trends within some of these dips, almost like several independent events were superimposed on top of each other. And at this time, this star drops in its brightness over 20%. This means that whatever is blocking its light has an area of over a thousand times the area of our planet Earth. This is truly remarkable. And so the citizen scientists, when they saw this, they notified the science team that they found something weird enough that it might be worth following up. And so when the science team looked at it, we're like, "Yeah, there's there's probably just something wrong with the data." But we looked really, really, really hard, and the data were good. And so, what was happening had to be astrophysical, meaning that something in space was getting in the way and blocking starlight. And so, at this point, we set out to learn everything we could about the star to see if we could find any clues to what was going on. And the citizen scientists who helped us in this discovery, they joined along for the ride, watching science in action firsthand. First, somebody said, "Well." You know, 
what if this star was actually very young, and it still had the cloud of material it was born from surrounding it? And then somebody else said, "Well, what if the star had already formed planets, and two of these planets had collided, similar to the Earth-Moon forming event?" Well, both of these theories could explain part of the data, but the difficulties were that the star showed no signs of being young, and there was no glow from any of the material that was heated up by the star's light. And you would expect this if the star was young, or if there was a collision and a lot of dust was produced. And so somebody else said, "Well, how about extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence?" And it is my job, my responsibility as an astronomer, to remind people that alien hypotheses should always be a last resort. Now, I want to tell you a story about that. It involves data from a NASA mission, ordinary people, and one of the most extraordinary stars in our galaxy. A huge swarm of comets. That are passing by the star in a very elliptical orbit. Well, it ends up that this is actually consistent with our observations. But I agree, it does feel a little contrived. You see, it would take hundreds of comets to. There might be a whole new planet on the other side of Pluto. It's named 2012 VP113, jokingly dubbed Biden. Get it? Uh, Corey Powell, editor at large for Discover Magazine and Studio. How you doing, Corey?、Uh, VP Biden. Right on. There we go. <laughs> Correct on that. Two images show you. This is the arrow, obviously pointing to it. But there are three dots on here. One is red. One is green. One is blue. Right. What's significant? So this is this is the actual discovery image. Basically, two astronomers were looking one little patch of sky, very very far away, looking for exactly this kind of thing. Stars don't move. Planets or anything that's like a planet does. So this is color coded. This is what they saw on different nights. They're looking for one thing moving. They color coded it to to show that all these stars are staying still. This thing is moving, and the way it's moving. So this is just one. It's one object color coded. Is three, Pluto on this? Pl Pluto is in a whole different part of the sky. So this is way out there. This is way out there. Well, this is more does, than more than twice as far away as Pluto. Unbelievable. Why does this matter, Corey? Well. There are two ways you can look at it. I think you know, I look at it first of all as a as an exploration question. That there, you know, we know where we are on Earth. We've mapped our planet. Our solar system is still terra incognita. It's full of surprises. This object is something that astronomers said shouldn't even be there. There's a whole other solar system beyond the planets that we know that are full of these things that are sort of planets, sort of comets. Some of them they call dwarf planets. That's what they're calling this one. What we're seeing is. If we have the other thing, like we have the sun going in a circle like this, and then we have this nemesis star going in a larger orbit around, and at some point in time they will meet, where the sun is rotating around in the galaxy, while this one is coming in like this, the orbit of this planet coming this way, or the nemesis, if you call it that, would travel much, much slower. And it will actually seems like it's having a dance with our sun. Now, let me prove that to you that that is actually going on. What's this? Sun is setting. The disk is still visible. That's why we have a black dot. Still visible. And now, ooh. The sun is almost gone now, almost. Now pay attention. Right here, we again have the curtain of chemtrails. I've been speaking about this since I was talking in Ohio. The sun, the sun can't shine through it, and it's a very thin sheet of clouds, or chemtrail-induced clouds. I call it the canopy. But look at the reflection here. This is not an error in the dome or in the camera. This reflection here, or this hue, right here, is not centered in a direct line to our sun. Our sun is right there, and you can see it is offset. Offset. It's not directly above it, and it would be. Okay, this is not an optical illusion. It would be. 
Now follow this. Right there. That was a slip up. Next frame. That was in Monterey you saw there. It's very foggy in Monterey right now in Mexico. Look at that. Still offset. Offset. Very offset. Still there. It remains. And the sun is still in the process of setting. So wouldn't it be logical to think that this one also changes appearance? Yes, naturally, because the sun or the earth is in movement. So this will be complementary to the movement. But it is not. It is stationary. Look at that. The sun is below the horizon. Way below the horizon now. Okay, there's not even a light cast on the waters. Agree? Now what's this? Two minutes apart. What's going on here, people? Did the Earth suddenly decide to rotate the other way? I think we would have some tsunamis here on planet Earth. That would not be able to be hidden from anybody because they would cost millions of lives, billions for that matter. I think it's 80% of the world's populace is living by the coastlines. 80% of all the populace at the coastlines. 57% of those is living in the big cities. And they're lying at the coastlines. So when the earth go to and fro like a drum car and it will be removed like a cottage, it will fall over and never rise again. We are looking at 2.5 billion people in a matter of hours. And we're talking about a mile wide, the high waves coming in. But what is going on here? The sun is down. Okay? This is an hour and eight minutes since we started. It is still there. Very bright very bright. This is not our sun that is doing this. Okay? Now it's falling down again. You see it? And again we get this coral red sky. Let's go back. Take it again if you missed it. Sun is setting. It's very bright. Extreme white out. And there's hardly any chemtrails, but look at the white out. But again, you see the horizon. We got this curtain. And again, now we are 20 minutes into the sunset. Right down, 20 minutes in. You can clearly see the sun is still up. There's a reflection on the waters. The sun is still up. Sun is still up. And it's going, 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 and there it hits the horizon at 18.10. And that will be Pacific time. That will be 6.10 p.m. Pacific time. And now it starts to go down. Go below the horizon. See that there is a displacement of this bubble. It is off, meaning there is an object sitting over here, in this vicinity, straight down here, right there, next to the sun.
damage from his face. From his fault. It is off. Meaning that it's an optic signal over here. And this is in straight down here. Right down. Next to the sun. Right 